Now for those of you that want to have herbs on your porch or if you want to have a small garden in a pot, we have some great examples out here which I'll show you what we're doing for the Heritage Gardener Symposium. But if you want to just do some at home, I think these are just the best. We got them at um, Walmart and they're like $9 a container. I think they're very well made and I like the sizes. This is about the biggest I could get at Walmart. We put three holes in the bottom. You could use a big nail or you could drill it. We drilled these, turn it upside down, drill down through it. And you've got an instantly wonderful, good looking galvanized container for under $10. This one might have been 12. Then what I would do is just get your, your good dirt I'm not going to do right now, but fill it up to right about two inches below the rim. It's a good thing. And then pack it down lightly. Put water in it to um, stabilize it, then put a little bit more dirt on top. And then, because you may not want to use these plastic trays, and these are good looking, then just go ahead, soak your seeds. Like these are, well, you probably won't put this in. This is small sugar pumpkin. And these get to be. Um, they're really going to be too big for this. They tell you, you know, all the instructions are on the side. But you could do um, like cilantro. Arugula is just great in containers. It's highly generous. It just grows. And so if you, you try these out, we've got some, if you want to buy them from us, that'd be okay. We have some extras. We did a big installation at the library restaurant recently, so we have a few buckets left. And then if you want to do it in a larger way, right behind Lamar, you'll see there are these county line uh, silver galvanized feed, feed containers. We used ones at the library restaurant that are about uh, six feet long and they come with a little valve on the side. We learned about them through using them as a compost bin. That's where our vermiculture bed is. Because the side valve, we just use that to collect the worm juice and then pour that on our plants. The plants just love it. It couldn't be easier. You don't have to turn anything. The worms turn it for you. It creates the juice. So these yeah. small ones, the four, the two or whatever, it's three foot, I think, don't have valves on the sides. So you need to either put a valve in the side or just let it drain out by doing holes. I'm just warning you because you don't want to have waterlogged beds. That would be really bad. And you can put gravel in the bottom of this if you want to whatever you want. I find these are used for such a short term that people usually just dump them out and just redo them later in the year. These would not be suitable for carrots, but you could grow carrots in this because a carrot, if you use baby carrots, choose your carrots wisely. You could have precious carrots. You could just scatter the carrot seeds around the edge with a grandchild or yourself and they'll grow on down and then have some other things taller in the middle. We love growing dill. I mean, there are just so many, there's, it's, a, it's just endless. So the Welcome back to the Boundless Gardener. I wanted to share with you some of our different techniques in doing container gardens. And this is when we're getting ready for an exhibition at Castro's Historical Society, and it's featuring the three sisters, corn, beans, which are heritage varieties, and squash. And before we focus too much on this, I wanted to show you this metal bin out here that says County Line on it. That is one of the galvanized bins that we refer to in the lecture that you've just watched. And they're very good for home consumption. We've turned it upside down. So you'll see that it needs to have some holes in the bottom of it. So back to this. What's really interesting about these is that they've grown so fast. I believe we've had the corn in the ground, let me think, since about the 5th of May. This is the 19th of June. And so that's been going now. And they were already about that tall when I got them. So let's say that they're eight week old. Uh, corns. That's pretty cool. Look how tall they already are. And then the beans were soaked about the third week of April. So they're at least, we know they're eight week old beans and they're already just racing up these poles. The poles are made out of polygonum, which is a knotweed and it's a noxious invasive in our area. And we just decided to repurpose it when we were clearing a thicket. So we cut them off, tied them at the top, and I'm sure the beans are going to overgrow them, but at least it gives us a support for when we transport them to the event because we're going to show them off in these bins. In any event, these heritage beans are very interesting. They have quite wiry stems. They are rough to touch, and they really like to cling to things. I've been kind of amazed as I've been working with them, trying to train them back up these knotweeds. They love to grow with the corn, and you know, traditionally, 
corn was planted by the Native Americans, it would have had um, a fish, fish emulsion, some very rich substance at the bottom because they're heavy feeders to be able to produce the corn. And then the beans were planted at the base so that they would grow up the bean stalks as a support. And then the squash also would be ground cover or they could grow up the stalks as well. So we're very excited about the way these are looking and you can see that they're flowering. A couple of them already have beans made as beans, so I'm recording which of the different varieties are producing beans earliest because the early settlers would have wanted to have food as soon as possible. Thank you so much for joining us for this Garden Talk Salon. I'm Mary Palmer, Dargan.